Hello everyone, welcome to Aussie Live, uh, our second session of the day. Uh, to the, in this room we have Julie Lindsay, uh, who is going to show us how to flatten our classroom using her recipe, which is fantastic and I'm really excited about today and the events to come. Um, Julie is an educator that travels the world sharing her recipe for flattening classrooms. Um, Currently, she and I are only about 10 minutes away from each other because Julie lives in a coastal town um, near my hometown, so it's great to be close to someone uh, in, in our world. Now, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors and supporters for helping us with Aussie Live, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, Steve Hargan and the Learning Revolution, and the Australia E-Series are, are bringing you this session. Uh, Cyber Academy has sponsored us, which is fantastic. And also Coach Carol and Shambles, our technical guru who helps us out a lot, are also supporting the event. So thank you very much to all those people. Now, what I'd like you to do, if you can, you can see some little icons on the left. If you just uh, Grab one of those icons and place it where you are in the world on the map and it can show us where we've got listeners from right now. So to grab that icon, you can just go to the right hand side of the screen and click on the arrow object to select your object and just drag it across. Okay, permissions are there. Okay, I can see Peggy's found her tool. Great, lots of smiley faces popping up. Wonderful. It looks like we've got a, a few listeners from, quite a few listeners in Australia, which is fantastic, and Peggy over in the States. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next slide. That brings us to Julie's session. So Julie, when you're ready, take it away. Thanks, Ness, and uh, thank you so much for all of your organisation. Hi everybody, Julie Lindsay here, and it's wonderful to see you in the room. It's 9am here on the east coast of Australia, Sydney Daylight Saving Time, and this is a great time to present. So it's a little cloudy outside, it's a bit cooler today where I am. It's been quite warm and humid up here. But I've got a few things I want to share with you today, and there'll be... Um, um, and we see moderators. PD, uh, I'll let this fix that up for you. There'll be a little bit of interaction. I realise my slides probably look a bit small. I, I've been in the habit of uploading images rather than the full PowerPoint because it's a lot quicker. And then I remember this morning that it actually makes the slides look a bit smaller, the images. But that's okay. We'll survive. I didn't want to redo it in case something went wrong. <laughs> All right, so that's me. And I have uh, done a few things. I'm actually into my uh, second year now of my uh, doctorate. I'm with the University of Southern Queensland, which I'm enjoying immensely. And uh, I'm back in Australia now, 18 months after many years overseas. And it is good to be back in Australia. It's great to have this conference in the Australian time zone. And thank you to those people who have made it in internationally to this event. Just a little uh, word about my international journey. I started in, from Melbourne. I'm actually a Melbourne girl. All my family are in Melbourne. Uh, we went to Zambia in 1998, uh, we then went to Kuwait, we went to Bangladesh, we went back to the Middle East, to Qatar, and we went to China, and this was over 15 years of teaching and travelling, and I was IT director, e-learning coordinator, curriculum coordinator, various positions in international schools in that time. And it's just wonderful to come back to a place like Ocean Shores, where after living in mega cities like Beijing and Dhaka, uh, you really appreciate what we have here in Australia so much more. But, you know, we must ask ourselves, why go global? And that's my daughter when we lived in Qatar, uh, about all of our flags there. So really going global is learning about the world with the world. And it's something that we need to think, well, we don't actually have to leave anywhere. We can actually do that from our desk, as we're doing now, from our desktop. 
and uh, we can take our student board from our classrooms. It's just a matter of knowing how. Welcome to those people who are popping in. Great to see you. So I'd like to go over some simple actions to go global. If you want to have a flat, global and connected classroom, these are the actions that I suggest you can take to start to move in that direction. And they can be called actions or they can be called steps. I'm calling them actions today. So the first action is to connect. So we need to be looking at who we're connecting with, who is in your personal learning network. This is a tweet from uh, one of our Black Classroom Certified Teachers, Tamara, who is based in Italy. And she actually quoted from uh, the book, <coughs> our book, Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds. And the greatest changes of our future will not be the technology, but the power of people as they connect. And it's putting in the time, it's that people now, it's Saturday morning in Australia, putting in that time uh, not to sleep, not to go shopping, but to be here at this conference to make connections, to make valuable connections, to hear a little bit about what I'm saying, but more importantly, to reach out to other people who are in this room and say, well, hey, what are you doing? Uh, maybe there's something we can do together. So think about that. Well, who, who is in your network? How do you develop better networks? And of course, these sort of conferences are just perfect for con continuing those connections. And then we need to look at, of course, what are the technologies that we're using to cement those connections and to keep the information coming to us. And of course, RSS uh, technology, where we can syndicate our uh, material, the stuff that we do, and that we can aggregate other people. So we bring the information, we pull it to us, and then, of course, we push our material out there. And we have a number of ways to do that now, including RSS readers, uh, social bookmarking, um, networking organisations, etc. So think about how are you getting your hands on the good stuff? How are you getting your hands on the information that you need to know without wasting time going out and searching for it? Thank you, Peggy. Thanks for that. So we need to look at strategies for meaningful interactions. How are you connecting yourself? Then how are you going to connect your school? And how are you going to connect your students? So it becomes a, a process uh, being personally connected. And sometimes you might feel, perhaps you feel like you're the only connected educator in your school. And I know what that feels like. I've been there many times in the past uh, with that sort of isolated feeling. But of course, you don't need to be isolated anymore. With technology, you can connect with anyone, anytime. And even if people in your immediate vicinity aren't particularly connected yet, uh, you can still have valuable experiences and interactions. But then you do need to look at, well, how can I move my school forward? How can I connect uh, the school and, and come up with some strategies and, and policies and guidelines even uh, that uh, you need to implement that can then connect your students? So what, what is your guideline for student blogging? What is your guideline for student use of social media? Those sort of questions are really valuable uh, to be asking in schools at the moment and to be discussing at uh, roundtable staff meetings and with parents and in many other forums. We talk about um, our connection taxonomy. And this is, uh, let me just explain this. This is uh, looking at how to make global connections and starting within your own class. So really, interconnection is the first level. And if you're not able to connect your own class, then it's, it's a lot harder to go global. So it's, it's a big step when people say, oh, I want to go global. It is a big step, but these are little steps that you can take in between. So, so when your class walks out of the door at 3 o'clock, 3.30, whatever, in the afternoon, how are you then still connected with them? Do you have a class blog? Do you have a class wiki? Do you have a, a learning management system where you can all go in in the evening and, and interact? Do you have a Ning or whatever technology, a Google site, uh, whatever technology you're, you're using, uh, there must be some way that you can be connected with your class. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, you need to be on the computer at night or connected and interacting with the students every night. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that the students need to be able to connect with each other. They need to know where uh, the conversations are and the material is for the learning objectives at the time and setting something up, a simple class wiki. I used to run a wiki-centric classroom for many, many years, and it just, it's that thread of connection. 
So once, once you've established that, you then start to look at, well, how can I then connect to my class with other classes? Now, it could be the class down the hall. It could be the class in the school down the road. It could be the class on the other side of the country. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that far away. But you need to work out, well, how can I now connect two classrooms together? Uh, and then perhaps three, et cetera. And then you need to look at level three. Uh, how can I then create a meaningful global interaction and global collaboration that is managed uh, where we connect a number of classrooms together? And what is that going to look like? And will that be a different toolkit or a tool set, et cetera? And what are the expectations on students and teachers? So once you've sort of got that organised, then you can start to look at connecting uh, classrooms with um, students to students and students actually taking on some leadership roles as well. So level four and five sort of start to blend into that student leadership, student uh, personalisation of learning, taking ownership of learning in a global context. So you can see how this hierarchy or this taxonomy of connection is, is quite important and, and starts to break down this whole, uh, oh, it's, it's a big thing to go global. So C.S. Lewis once said the next best thing to being wise oneself is to live in a circle of those who are. So I'm really fortunate this morning to be in a, a great circle of those who are wise. Thank you to the people who have just uh, come in in the last few minutes. And this is just a diagram uh, that I use to show uh, how one of our projects in particular uh, is organised with student teams, student cross-classroom teams. These, these teams are across the world, of course. Uh, and the circle of the wise is extended by including uh, researchers, pre-service teachers, expert advisors, keynote speakers, judges, etc. So it's not just teachers and students, but it is a, an extended community. At the moment, we've just kicked off a a newly designed flat connection global project which has classrooms around the world. And I mean, uh, lots of wonderful conversations with pre-service educators who are building into their course interaction with this project. So they're actually putting it into their curriculum that their pre-service teachers need to become expert advisors and judges, interact with um, uh, high school students and under get to understand what meaningful global collaboration looks like. Hello, Coach Carol. <laughs> Thanks for looking at the comments. Thank you. Okay. All right, the 60 second challenge. I'm going to put the timer on. Uh, I would like you to respond in the chat. Thanks. How connected are you as an educator? How are you connecting your students to the world? And we're going to have, let's see, can I do this quickly? Oops. No, 60 seconds is actually one minute, isn't it? There we go. Thank you very much. Let's have some comments in the chat, the chat window. How connected are you as an educator? How are you connecting your students to the world? Ian says Skyping. How else? Is anyone using Wiki? <laughs> Is anyone using Google Skype? <laughs> what are you using to connect? Heather's using iPad teaching. Juanita's using Moodle. PD3 connected through Google Hangout. Chris is um, a gay person. Good. You can book me. Uh -huh. You can book me for the tutorials. Very good. Thanks, Carol. Diane uses today's meet. Okay, good. All right, so it's a variety of tools and it's not all about one particular tool. It's about the best tool for you and your students and your network. Let's move on. Step two or action number two is to communicate. It is Peggy. Blackboard Collaborate is an awesome tool. I love it. Okay, so there are two types of communication that we need to think about and often people say to me, I want to Skype, I want to have that, that real-time connection with a global classroom, someone else that doesn't look like us, doesn't sound like us, etc. And that's great. And synchronous communication really fosters engagement with students and excitement in the classroom. And it's, you, know, you can talk about it for days, what they said and what we said and what they look like, etc. But, but when you want to sustain a global project, synchronous communication isn't going to do that. So we need to look at asynchronous communication as well. 
So our traditional classroom, of course, is separated by location and separated by time. But the connected or flat classroom <coughs> is unified by the internet and unified by asynchronous communication tools. And this is a really important concept and mindset to, to get around. So, you know, to communicate synchronously, this is just some screenshots of some meetings I've been running recently, kicking off projects. Some of my project managers there and uh, teachers from the projects were using a tool called Fusebox, which hasn't quite got the facility of Blackboard, but it's doing a great job for us at the moment. So, synchronous communications to kick off projects, to touch base. We have regular meetings uh, just about every week with teachers for every project uh, to, to connect and share problems and, and look at what the next steps are. Are great. Uh, virtual participation is another form of communication in terms of blended. You can have real-time virtual participation or you can have asynchronous virtual participation. Um, the picture on the left there is from a conference I ran in Beijing. Uh, my uh, girls there were uh, video streaming the conference in real time to the world. The picture on the right there is my daughter in one of her usual poses on the couch. Uh, she was a virtual participant at the uh, flat classroom conference in Japan. Uh, doing all sorts of wonderful things as uh, while she was sitting here in Australia. So that, you know there are ways to uh, participate virtually and uh, sorry asynchronously and synchronously. Uh, and what, talking also about blended communication, this is just a screenshot. I know it's a bit tricky to look at, but the red arrow there is pointing to Ning activity. I just took this last night actually. It's a, a current Ning uh, flat classroom. Sorry, flatconnectionsglobalproject.net is the URL. Uh, look, this is uh, students' uh, recent activity on the Ming. You can show they're updating their uh, profiles and see that. They're commenting on each other, they're posting blog posts, etc. The blue arrow is pointing to real time chat. Now, uh, and we have students, once again, opposite sides of the world when they can connect, and they do. Sometimes it's evening on one side and the other students are in class on the other side of the world um, and they're connecting in real time chat as well. So, so this, um, I do love the NIN. I know some people have moved away from it and you, you find your own level in terms of tools. But I do love what the NIN is doing for our project, Flat Connections Global Project uh, .net. You will find it there. Okay, so that was uh, communicate. Now, the next action is to take some action on citizenship. And uh, this is one of my really old slides, and I just love this because um, I was just reading some stuff from Mike Riddle again this morning. Uh, he's uh, one of the, the gurus, of course, that has the book through ISTE, Digital Citizenship for Schools. And he says digital citizenship is the norms of behaviour with regard to technology use. So if we can distill it down to that essential idea, we can then widen it in terms of the enlightened digital citizenship model. And if you look at this, we have uh, what are called the rays of understanding. These are the rays going out. Uh, and these are the, essentially the, the work from uh, Mike Ribble has been influenced by his, very much by his wonderful work. So you've got your safety, privacy, educate respect, etc. But then areas of awareness. We need to, of course, have technology access. We need to have technical awareness individual, social, cultural, and global awareness. I think this is where uh, the, the edge is in terms of global interactions and global collaboration. So you need to have that global understanding as a digital citizen in terms of uh, what people have access to, uh, what some of the uh, uh, different countries and political systems uh, have, are doing around the world so that you understand how you can connect. So you know, how you connect with China, for example, you, you won't be connecting with China using a whole Google Apps set up uh, because um, it's blocked. So having that, you know, just, in, just as a very simple example, uh, the, the cultural, of course, the cultural uh, area of awareness and understanding how to communicate with people from other cultures while you're working online, uh, what, what are appropriate conversations, what, what would be a to-do conversation, for example. So these need to be embedded into conversations to do with digital citizenship that you're having with students, that you're having with colleagues as well. Okay, so this is a, a shot from our conference in Beijing where we had, uh, we had students come from Oman and all different places to, to, um, to Beijing. 
So we're talking about citizenship, global competency and confidence, you know, building that, that competency, that understanding about what it means to, to meet people face to face and be able to converse and work with people and building that confidence that you, you understand other cultures to the extent that you are able to interact and learn more, you know, have that confidence to ask questions. Just a word about our DigiTeen project, Flat Connections, we run a, a, what's called DigiTeen or DigiTween uh, for the younger students. And this is where we take digital citizenship uh, into action. So we have uh, teams, cross-classroom teams, teams introduce each other, uh, each introduce themselves through what we call handshakes. Uh, they research digital citizenship topics based on the enlightened digital citizenship model. Uh, they collaboratively uh, author a wiki with the research that they, they've done. Then they design an action project and they implement this action project in their school community. And then of course we have celebration, reflection and sharing of outcomes. So this is a, a 12 week project and this is the essential design of it. So once again, as you're thinking of uh, how you're going to flatten your classroom, the, uh, the recipe, the steps, the actions, etc. Uh, this is a, a simple representation of the type of planning that goes into a sustained uh, global collaboration. This project has about mm, 350, 400 students in it at the moment, I think. And digital, once again, digital citizenship action. Uh, some of the outcomes from uh, these projects are just wonderful. I looked at a couple from last semester to, to show you uh, this morning. So the students from a school uh, over in the States developed this Minecraft game to, to teach etiquette and respect online and they actually did a, a screenshot of it, a, 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 sorry, a screencast uh, walking people through Minecraft to show them how they could learn about etiquette and respect online. Um, yeah, Peggy, the Digi Team name doesn't exist anymore. You need to go to uh, flatconnections.com and you will find under the Flat Projects link a link to all of the archives. Okay, yeah. And uh, another example, students put together um, a video and some information to share strategies to overcome cyberbullying. So. Uh, so there are many different ways that students can actually take the material that they've researched and interacted with other students around the world and bring it back to their local community uh, in terms of actions, running assemblies, running lessons for other people, uh, creating games, creating videos, etc. So another message, of course, is to be a digi teacher when we're talking about digital citizenship, to actually take on this role uh, of being a digi teacher. Uh, as part of this flattening classroom approach. So being able to research the technology and lead the way in some form. You know, I know we, we are constantly battling because students are always seem to be so far ahead of us in terms of facility and flexibility with the technology, but, but they're not really. It's really us as educators who need to lead the way in terms of curriculum and pedagogy. So it just in, involves knowing a little bit more about the technology. For example, being able to um, encourage students to create a mine, Minecraft game, uh, I think is, is very commendable. And I know that teacher perhaps didn't know a lot about Minecraft, but the results from that project were wonderful. So, and to monitor and be engaged, uh, I showed the mini examples before. Um, where the students, uh, these are high school students, are in the NING, and we've got 500 students in that project. They're on, on the NING, interacting, creating content, etc. But they're not there alone. The teachers are there as well. Teachers are in there monitoring, interacting all the time. So you don't uh, run these projects. You don't go global and put students into social media spaces and say, OK, I'll see you in three weeks' time when it's time for me to do an assessment. OK, it's very important that you're actually in there with them and uh, and building into that at your assessment some, some sort of, um, you know, uh, pattern or contribution uh, requirement for those spaces. So avoid the fear factor and make a difference is another message and uh, model legal wisdom and choose your own copyright. Of course, there's a, there's a whole other presentation really in terms of creative commons and copyright. But just to mention it, that's part of being a digi teacher. 
Okay, another 60 second challenge. Let me put the timer on. What are you doing in your school to foster global digital citizenship? Let's put some comments into the window there. Or any questions you might have at this stage as well. One minute. Okay, so Nessa's using Twitter to teach about accepting followers, classroom conversations about safety online. What are other people doing? And I'm just trying to find this URL. I'm going to give this URL. For projects. Okay, my mentor is teaching digital literacy skills to remote regions by using face to face and online training. Great. Diane's going to have a whole day focusing on global technology, cyber safety. Excellent. Okay, so grab some ideas of, from what other people are doing. Carol's talking about digital identity confident, confidently and safely. Confidently and safely, sorry. Okay. Steve's talking about an ongoing conversation in a course called Life Matters that students participate in all year. All right, great. Okay. All right, let's keep moving here. All right, so our next action uh, is to collaborate. And of course, you know, collaboration is something we do already. It's more than cooperation. Uh, collaboration, once again, is a whole other com big conversation we could have, just mentioning it here. We do align it with standards. Many of the standards, including the ISTE standards, teachers and students and administrators talk about collaboration. And of course, today it is enhanced by using technology. But collaboration must start with contribution. If we don't have contribution, we don't have collaboration. Of course, in, a, in an asynchronous or a virtual context, uh, we need to see people contributing. And this little cartoon says, you know, I can, I can prove that you do not exist in the world. Uh, do you answer your emails, Facebook, instant message, blog, etc.? And this little boy says, no, but you can see me, can't you? Well, of course, she walks out of the room, which is like being on opposite sides of the world. No, we can't see you. If you don't contribute, if you don't blog, if you don't uh, do something in an online capacity, uh, you're not contributing, and therefore you can't collaborate. So it's very important to know how to contribute, where to contribute, uh, you know, Twitter, of course, in terms of education uh, educators, using Twitter, using a blog, using RSS, means that you're actually contributing and reacting and uh, etc. So slightly in the classroom is really technology-enabled collaboration. That left-hand picture is one of our tech guys uh, live streaming the conference that we ran in Japan last year, uh, Real Time to the World. Go give get. Hey Sebastian, that's great. Quote from Steve, thank you. Very good. So we must ask ourselves, if collaboration is a needed and required 21st century skill, which it is because it is on many of our standards and we talk about it a lot, so therefore educators need to not only teach it but employ and model it as well. So I think we assume sometimes that people do know how to collaborate. I think we assume that educators have got it all in the bag, so to speak, but maybe we don't. Maybe we need to really focus on this a lot more and understand it at a deeper level, particularly uh, when it's infused with technology. Uh, oh, that's just a, a slide about collaboration leading to co-creation and this sort of wiki history where you can see someone's gone in and edited someone else's work. This is a student student work. And this is like you know, one example of true collaboration where you can actually you know, co-create and co-write something. All right, I'm going to give you another 60 second challenge here to throw some things into the window. How do you teach collaboration? What technology tools foster collaboration? 60 seconds. How do you teach collaboration? And what, and what technology tools are you using?
Welcome, Anne. Thanks for coming. Oh, she's coming and gone away. That's okay. <laughs> Google apps are great. Oh, she is. She's there. It's good. So using a single Google, Google Doc for all students to brainstorm on. Google Drive. Um, has anyone used a tool called Padlet? Um, has anyone used a tool called Etherpad? Um, and of course, my old favourite, I'll keep bringing this up. The wiki. Yep. Oh, voice thread, of course, thanks, Anne. Those audio and multimedia tools are so important. Um, symbol, uh, not symbol, the other one. Um, I've got a slide coming up with a tool and I'll show you a minute. Okay, great. Titan pad. Okay, I think I'll use that one. That sounds good. All right, so let's keep moving along here. I do want to hear some of your voices towards the end as well, not just mine. Choice. <clears throat> so if we were to choose a piece of fruit, which one would we choose? Depending on you know what we really our personal choice, our what we really like to eat, etc. So Mark Twain said, beef steak. Oh, that should say beef steak all liver, not all liver. Sorry about that typo. Beef steak all liver quite took away Philip's choice of power. He begged for a glass of milk. A couple of typos there, but never mind. The message is there. So it's widening the choice. And putting choice into the classroom will naturally direct students toward their own interests and strengths. It can allow students to shine in unimaginable ways. I have a room full of, of wonderful educators here. You, you know exactly what I mean. And you also know that sometimes you're not able to give choices depending on the situation in your school or depending on the situation of the curriculum that you're teaching, etc. But the aim for a flat classroom is to give as much choice as you can in terms of uh, learning spaces, that means physical and virtual spaces, and choices for technology and choices for learning outcomes. So we can use Web 2.0 technologies uh, to give different choice, you know, give students choices in terms of how they question, how they build, how they invent, how they connect, how they have meaning and make meaning by understanding, and how they can excel. And I think you know, in the last uh, 10 years, really, it's almost been 10 years when a web 2.0 has really been in the classroom. It has just opened up horizons in so many different ways. And it's really, uh, you know, if you're still struggling with your IT department and you're still working uh, and learning in a more lockdown environment, uh, you need to keep those conversations going to open up as much as you can and to, to get these uh, so that you can immediately, fluently, uh, go to a Skype call, go to a whatever you need in your classroom to connect uh, with you and your students, with you and other students as well. <coughs> uh, choices for different learning styles. We run a, a project called K-2 Building Bridges to Tomorrow. And this is an image from one of the teachers who was in the project last year uh, where she introduced voice threads to three and four year old nursery students. This is from Phuket, of course. And it's just, you know, we, we took this project on a couple of years ago uh, to look at how how students at that young level could actually connect globally and co-create things and collaborate. And of course, VoiceThread, having that as a choice, is just such a wonderful uh, opportunity for students to, to have a voice without having to rely on a text-based communication. And this goes for any age, of course, but this is a good example at this age level. All right, so we're up to create, and it's almost morning tea time. They look, they look good, don't they? The next uh, action is create, and of course, uh, Blue's taxonomy, we know the revised Blue's taxonomy, where create is the higher order thinking. And of course, if you look at the work of Andrew Church's, uh, um, was it edoragami.wikispaces.com, Andrew's got some wonderful uh, material there for the digital Bloom's taxonomy that you should take a look at as well. But I ask you to challenge yourself to move from create to co-create. I mentioned this already. And it's not just about you creating. It's what you can create with other people, what you can co-create, and what that feels like. And sometimes that feels uncomfortable because you want it to be your own work. I know as, as, a, as an educator, uh, you know, sometimes I want it to just be my own work. And, but other times it needs to be work that I've co-created and I need to make allowances that other people have opinions as well and that maybe my work can be improved by the uh, interaction with others. And I've seen it time and time again. 
how together we can build something stronger than than just one individual. So it's it's a good message to to talk about with your students as well. How do you move from creation to co-creation? Oh, this is the one I wanted to show you. The poplet. Poplet's a great little tool. You can't really see those words, but it's a, a mind mapping tool. But it's online, and you can do it asynchronously and you can co-create something between classrooms that are not you know, face to face. And we use this in our A Week in the Life project, grade three to five, as a brainstorming tool at the start of the project. It is wonderful. I really love it. So once again, this whole idea of co-creation, Emily McCurran is based in the um, Punahou School in Hawaii, which is a workshop there last July. And she created this little diagram diagram about co-creation. So it's about um, bringing the world in and looking in and then looking out and going out, creating and working with uh, different people. So I'd just like to share this little, little diagram here to help us get our head around what this is. Uh, just more examples here, a week in the life project co-created voice So once again, students would uh, share multimedia. For example, the top left there, the housing team shared images of, of housing in their different countries, their different areas, and then students got to respond via voice thread to say, oh, that's interesting. We don't see sloped, sloped roofs or we don't see wooden houses, etc. So, so you know, by sharing and then interacting uh, as, a, as a reflection and response part of the project, it was a very valuable learning experience, once again, enhanced by Web 2.0 tools. OK, I'm up to the last uh, action here, which is to celebrate. So you've done all of this hard work, lots of hard work, putting together a global collaboration, flattening the classroom, joining students and teachers, uh, intercultural understanding, etc. So it's time to celebrate. And one way that uh, we foster celebration is through student summits. Students actually come into a blackboard. That's a, a screenshot of a blackboard meeting. Uh, this is a little boy, a grade four boy from Nepal, uh, who came in and uh, the students had hand-drawn images to represent their involvement in the project. The teacher scanned them and brought them into Blackboard, as you can see there, and the, the, the students talk for a couple of minutes each about their involvement. And it's just a wonderful experience to see it at grade four level. And then, of course, we, we do it at the high, right up to the high school level as well. And to build this confidence in amongst the students, they, they are confident speakers in a virtual capacity. Is, uh, is a really good goal. So if you have access to Blackboard, or if not, you know, even not, there are plenty of tools out there. I do believe Fusebox, the one that I use, is, is now freely available. And there are other tools that you can bring students into. And you know, consider running some meetings at night, perhaps with your older students. Say, well, I'm going to be online at 8 o'clock tonight. Come in and we'll, we'll talk about the assignment for 15 minutes. And just get them into that habit of being connected, not connected all the time. 24-7, but just being connected in different ways to you and to uh, their learning, basically. So, of course, we celebrate different things, and there's just, that's just a few of them. And, uh, you know, making the world a better place, I think, is really, should perhaps be top of the list, not down the bottom there, but, uh, you know, this enhanced understanding that we have through global connections. Okay, so another 60 second challenge. This is the last one, I think. So what is missing here? We've gone through the actions. There they are again. What would you add? What would you take away? What is the most important one, do you think? How will you use this in your classroom or in your school on Monday morning? Is there anything here that you're going to go to school on Monday and say, look, Julie said this, I think we should talk about this. Is there anything particular that resonates with you? I'm going to start the timer. 60 seconds. Throw some things into the chat for me. So this is going to check out how you can get better hardware to allow Skype, yeah. Okay, so Peggy's saying, where do you start? Are those intended to be sequential? Does it matter? Uh, good question, Peggy. 
you really can't do anything until you're connected. You've got to connect yourself. You've got to work out your communication. Uh, you do have to talk about digital citizenship. But these actions are actually designed to be sequential, but uh, not necessarily in all cases. Yes, that's right. And that's, and that's what I'm doing more recently, Peggy, actually, is to look at how you move from one to the other, but not necessarily sequentially, and then what, what's the catalyst for, for one that's coming from another, et cetera. So cooperate, yes. Yes, Sebastian. Um, and that's a good word. And what is it says, relative is your life will change once you are networked. Yeah, cooperate's a very good one. And I put in there called community, and I'm, I'm thinking community is, is assumed, but maybe it should actually be an action as well. Building community, once you're connected and you start to communicate, you really should build community. Any global project should be a community, and you take the journey together. Champion. Oh, I like that one too, Sebastian. Thank you. Great. Some good thinking happening here. Very good. All right. Um, just, I just want to share some some extra things with you before I finish. I've got to just have a dozen more slides. I just to let you know about the Flat, uh, Flat Connections Global Project. If you haven't looked at this before, just as examples of things that are happening in the world at the moment, and we have projects, from, as I said, from K to two all the way up to the High School Flat Connections Global Project. Uh, the Global Youth Debates one, that one in the middle, is an asynchronous formal debating uh, project. We have uh, classrooms, once again, from different parts of the world who use VoiceThread uh, to do a formal debate. So one class would do their um, five minute talk, and then in the next 24 to 48 hours, the next class would uh, respond, and then the other class would, et cetera. So it takes, we actually give them three weeks to get through a whole debate, and then we have a week of judging, and then we do the next round. Okay, so it's an amazing, amazing thing to see. And you can see that at um, uh, Global Youth Debates, uh, globalyouthdebates.com. Oh, there it is here, it's called globalyouthdebates.com. So these are some of the teams that we've had in the last 12 months or so. Uh, debating and, you know, if you do debating in your school, it's something you might like to consider coming and joining us or creating your own environment, your own uh, project where you do uh, this asynchronous style of debating. We actually put the, the classrooms into Ed Mojo as well so they get a chance to connect and do handshakes and get to know each other uh, in that um, in that tool, that uh, community tool Ed Mojo. The other one, okay, from Japan. Um, yeah, I come from this school. I don't think it's that one. Um, the, other, the other project I've been talking about, of course, is the Flat Connections Global Project, and it's a concept mashup. Because we're using the Horizon Report, the K-12 Horizon Report, uh, mashing it up with uh, David Price's book, uh, Open. And David's uh, got some great messages in terms of opening up education, opening up learning, uh, opening up the world, etc. in his book. We're doing a webinar with David Price in a couple of weeks, uh, a free webinar that you're most welcome to uh, to attend as well and interact. The students will be there and the teachers and, uh, and David as well. But the whole point of um, any of these projects is that, you know, to flatten your learning, I mean, teachers are really the core. Now, we say that students are the core. Well, we know, we know we're, we're only here for our students, but teachers are the core in terms of community collaborative learning. It's, it's, uh, until the students become older, the teachers really have to have to manage and direct, direct this. And then, of course, the students become mixed up across the world, and then we have this extended community. And we need to build working relationships uh, as we build, as we flatten our learning. Oh, here we go, one more. I'm giving you one more here. So, I've shared with you our digital team project in terms of digital citizenship, Flat Connections Global Project. We're mashing up the, uh, you know, how do we open up learning, open education with the emerging technologies ideas. Uh, the Global Youth Debates is based on debating our topic actually is, is on sustainability at the moment. But, but what are you thinking about? What is an inspiring, challenging, relevant and global topic or theme 
that, you're, that you would like to use to join classrooms and learners across the world. Right, so let's start. If you, were, if you were going to start something next week, what, what, is it, what are you doing in your curriculum that you could say, well, I want to join with the world? This is current theme of beliefs, right? Yeah, well, Edith says it can never go back to the closed door. No, it's, it can't. It can't go back to the closed door. I know my friend Anne in the room, Anne Murchison. None of us could ever teach with a closed door again, could we, Anne? It just won't work. And probably many others of you in the room as well. Put your Twitter handles in, please. Yes, thank you. Please share Twitter handles and uh, perhaps you know, if you're teaching mathematics or social studies or humanities or whatever, start to reach out and connect. Great. Okay. Initially, my excuse that she just does it. <laughs> and that's the point. That's the point. All right. So. Just a couple of slides about getting started. I know, Peggy, you, you were nudging there about people asking how to get started. So the thing is, you've got to find like-minded educators. People in this room today are all already like-minded because you're here and you're curious about what this is all about. Uh, so that's why we've exchanged Twitter handles, etc. Uh, no problem, Anne. Uh, you need to design your outcomes. Successful global projects are quite methodically designed. And that doesn't mean you have to do a 12-week project. Uh, it means that you just have to make sure you and the other person or you and the other people are on the same page and you know that in four weeks' time you're going to be roughly in the same point of the project. Okay? That's, uh, that's really important. You need to have uh, tools that you're, you're all going to be happy to work with and you need to manage. Manage for success and stick to timelines as much as you can and just make sure. And, Always call them, you know, the first interaction, the first global project should be a, a pilot. I, always, I feel strongly about that because the first time through you will always be fine tuning, tweaking, etc. Uh, and then of course the next time you run it, it will look a little bit different as well because you've made it better. And so where do you start? All right, so we've got your know, flat connections. Uh, a lot of what we do is via subscription, so that's, that's how, how it's run. But of course, there are lots and lots of other places uh, where you can start. Global Classroom, I know Michael's presenting uh, this weekend as well. Lots of wonderful educators connected with the Global Classroom. IEARN is still one of my very, very favourites. That's where I started 20 years ago with IEARN Learning Circles. And uh, please join networks. You can come and join our flatconnections.net, which is our teacher educator Ning. I'd love to see you there. Lots of activity on the Ning at the moment with um, pre service teachers and uh, other teachers connecting and discussing collaboration. And of course, Global Education Conference Ning is another great one. And uh, if you've got any others you'd like to recommend, uh, please put them in the window as well. But it really starts with uh, perhaps joining something like an iron learning circle or a flat connection project or connecting with Global Classroom and finding a project. Uh, they've got many listed on their wiki there. Um, and just seeing how it's, it's run and then starting to think about, well, that was great, but I really want something to fit in with my curriculum, so therefore I'm going to do this next semester or next year or whatever. And, and I'm going to join a Global Education Conference meeting and reach out and see if I can find a like-minded educator who will do this with me. Great. Okay, good. Just a, a quick mention about the uh, conference in Sydney. While well, I've got your attention, <laughs> we're running a, a, a live conference in Sydney. Anna Murchison will be there with me, as, as well as many other great facilitators. It's at the Shaw School, June the 18th to the 20th. And if you go to flatconnections.com, it's right there, the link to the conference. We'd love to see you there. We're bringing students and teachers. And it's a process-based conference, and it's, it's about global project design, it's about action projects for students, it's, uh, it's about uh, alternative pedagogy and approaches to learning that will flatten your classroom. So if you're really hungry for some more and for something a little bit different, I know there are lots of conferences 
in Australia and in the world, particularly in Australia at the moment. Uh, but this is uh, quite an opportunity to join some of these wonderful facilitators at this event. And uh, that's the book that I uh, co-authored, Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds. If you're interested, that is available uh, on Amazon and as a Kindle version as well. And there's some links to do with Flat Connections, learning about the world with the world. Flatconnections.com, flatconnections.net is the teacher network. Any questions? We've got a couple of minutes, I know, before we want to dash to the next room. Any questions or comments? I welcome them. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. So if you have a question, you'll notice at the top of your screen where it says participants, you'll see a little hand. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, otherwise, you can type it into the chat. Seems like everyone's um everyone's fine. No questions. No problem. It's been great. It's been great to be here, and uh, I'll be back again at midday tomorrow. I've got another presentation, uh, a keynote presentation, midday tomorrow. But have a wonderful weekend, hopping in and out of these sessions. And uh, thanks very much. And stay in touch. Please get in touch with me if uh, if you want to know more or just connect in any way. Thanks, Ness, for all of your work and everybody. Thanks. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you so much, Julie. That was a fantastic session. I've taken more away from it to um, take to my classroom, so I thank you very much for that. And thank you to everyone for attending. We have another keynote session starting in about eight minutes with Nancy White, a fantastic presenter. Uh, so if you're interested, pop over there. And all you need to do to finish this session is to click out of your session. Thank you very much. I'll stop the recording now.